Welcome back to Rational Politics. This is part two of our uh, talk on the pharmaceutical industries here in America and how you're all getting screwed over so badly. But we're going to dedicate this portion of the show to insulin. I'd like to welcome back to the table Ike and Isaiah. Isaiah has an interesting story to tell because Isaiah unfortunately does suffer from diabetes and he discovered this when he was nine years old. Isaiah, why don't you very briefly tell us the story and who was to blame for you discovering that you have diabetes? It was a long story. I went over to a wrestling tournament for my cousin in Chicago, sadly, and in that time I had a drink that was a little too sugary and it, my pancreas decided I don't really f feel like working anymore. And so on my way home from that trip, I started to have all the symptoms of high blood sugar, the vomiting, the com almost comatose sleep, and a, the craving of water. As that happened, we got home, and my family just believed it was a stomach bug, because when you vomit a bunch, yeah. that's the first instinct. Nobody's going to go to diabetes right away. My grandma gave me ginger ale, because that's the mm -hmm. cure-all to stomach bugs. Turns out ginger ale also has a ton of sugar, a ton of sugar. which mm -hmm. just so happened to spike me just a bit more. And so I went another couple weeks, and then my dad brought me into the hospital, and they found out I had a blood sugar of approximately 766, uh, which a normal, typically, typically functioning human has around 120. So they got me on insulin, and I'm actually, so I'm a diagnosed type 1 diabetic from when I was 9. So this, the prices of insulin has always hit sort of close to home. I have really good insurance through my parents, but it's still something that I have to look down the pike, and when I turn 26, I'm not going to have that insurance anymore, and right. I have to figure out how I'm going to pay for what is essentially my life-saving drug. Absolutely. I'll tell you what, let, let's first have a look, little bit of history on where did insulin come from, because it's, it's a very interesting history. Not many people know this, but insulin is actually 100 years old this year, and they discovered how to uh, actually... Uh, invent, I'm going to use that word, insulin, up in Canada. Frederick Banting, Banting came up with a way to extract the pancreatic extract. Now, the pancreas in the human body is the one organ that helps keep sugar levels correct. John McLeod, who was the head of physiology at the University of Toronto, oversaw this process. Charles Best, Banting's assistant, helped refine the process and finally, a biochemist named James Polip helped to purify the insulin to make it human ready. And this was all done in 1921. So we can all think back to, you know, the mad professor's labs of Bunsen burners and <laughs> all the rest of it. They did not have all the modern equipment that they had today. Frederick Banting, who actually made the major discovery, didn't want a patent. And I don't know whether this would have changed anything or not, but he just refused to put his name on it. And this was 1923, after they had resolved all of the issues of making it human ready. His co-inventors, James Colip and Charles Best, they actually did patent insulin. However, they sold it, the patent to Toronto University for one dollar. Because what they firmly and honestly believe was this was so important, life-saving, life-changing medicine, it should just be there for humanity to use. Yeah, and to touch on that, they really wanted it to be free, but now we have, in today's society, over 30 million Americans rely on insulin just to survive. You have people from all different classes trying to pay for this insulin that is all the same price. So you have people in the top 1% having to pay penny change in for insurance, but then you also have on the opposite side, the people in impoverished areas, and sadly it's people of my community, the Mexican community, that are in these impoverished areas that are paying those extremely high copays, and also if they can't afford insurance, they're paying over-the-counter costs, which is just for generic, is about $100 per vial, which lasts about three days. So that kind of ties into your what you're taking some stances on with single payer, and right. if you want to talk on that just a little. Yeah, and I think, you know, what you touched on, Isaiah, is the real effect of um, profit-driven 
uh, policy. Um, it's the uh, human tragedy that's occurring right here in the richest nation on earth, um, where we have this life-saving medication, like you mentioned, uh, that the inventors wanted people to have um, access to uh, to treat their ailments, and um, instead of uh, you know making money for people, it would help um, help uh, human beings is, would, that are affected with diabetes survive, literally live. And now here in the richest nation on earth, less well-to-do um, communities rationing their insulin. Um, this, you know, is tragic because they can lose limbs. Um, they can, they're- Gangrene as well. They're, 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 they're compromising their, their health and well-being so that um, some pharmacy benefit management organization or pharmaceutical company or corporation or CEO can um, fly around in a private jet or have an extra million dollars in their already flush bank account. Right. They don't need that. Uh, what needs to be uh, in place is exactly what the inventors of this medication intended to, and that's that it be available uh, to everyone that needs it. And that's why they put that dollar patent on it, so that no one else would be able to uh, take the proprietary blend, the, the actual chemical composition or right. the production process of that insulin and um, and then profit off it. Uh, so Actually, they, they would then be able to patent it themselves right? if there's no patent. And what they were trying to prevent is the detriment to society that we're Correct. experiencing right now. Yeah, I mean, I read somewhere up to, upwards of a million people in America cannot afford their insulin. And you mentioned that there's people out there that are rationing insulin and it's <laughs> detrimental to their health. We actually have the stat here that it's about, six, according to the uh, American Diabetes Association, 650,000 people every day are rationing insulin because of the cost. That turns into these costs of in hospitals when they're, try, when they're losing limbs, right. yeah. their eyesight goes, they have to deal with glasses now, that just keeps piling up on them. and. It's insanely sad how so many people are struggling to pay for a drug that the inventors themselves didn't want to be paid for. Right, and it's morally abhorrent. Mm -hmm. It's just like, um, should somebody uh, be profiting um, off of someone who is, you know, experiencing a life-threatening um, situation? I don't think that yeah. you should profit off of people in their most vulnerable position in life. The thing that people don't seem to understand about the National Health Service in the UK <clears throat> is the way that it's actually structured. In the UK, there is a panel, and they negotiate with the drug companies, the pharmaceuticals, on what they are willing to buy the drug for. And they negotiate, and they negotiate. And if the, the pharmaceutical company <clears throat> thinks the price is maybe a little bit too low, obviously there'd be a negotiation. But the UK market's a huge market. Right. That's right. In England, if you get a prescription from a doctor, it's going to cost you nine pounds, 15 shillings, no matter the drug. It doesn't yeah. matter whether it's penicillin or the most expensive chemotherapy drug on the market. Which comes out to about $12, about 12 US bucks. dollars. About 12 bucks. Basically, in the UK, People spend, this is the entire population of the UK, they actually give the government approximately £1,500 per year, which is about $1,800. And that covers, over the course of a year, that covers the funding of the National Health Service. Just that. Yet they keep telling us over here, oh, it's going to cost billions of dollars, oh, it's going to cost billions of dollars. No, it's not. <laughs> not if it's done properly. Right, and the reason it's going to cost, you know, billions of dollars, which it really wouldn't, um, is because um, we do not allow the negotiation that you mentioned that happens in the UK to take place. Medicare and Medicaid are not allowed. They're not allowed to negotiate law. with the pharmaceuticals um, or the pharmacy benefit management organizations on the cost of the, the of the insulin, for instance. And right. so you wind up paying eight times the costs of uh, that you would pay in Canada or $300 for a vial 
instead of 20. Right. Um, and that's the effect of profit-driven healthcare system. I'd like, um, you know, to know, Isaiah, like, through uh, your experience, I'm sure, in the community, um, you've met folks who have experienced, you know, having to ration their insulin. Yeah, I have a couple people I know. I won't name them by name, but yeah. they're some friends of mine that they come from some poor communities and they're unable to afford insurance in general. If they're unable to afford the insurance, they're completely unable to afford insulin. And there's been a few times where we've had to, me and my family have had to donate pens and needles and things that outside just the basic insulin cost are still required to just deliver the insulin. You can't. A vial of insulin isn't going to deliver itself right. at all. You can't you, just drink. You can't just, it's not something you can drink. <laughs> right. But, yeah, so we've. I've had friends and family that I've had to personally give out and help them with these things that they can't afford and I've been fortunate enough to be blessed with better insurance and coming from a little bit better of a situation mm -hmm. and it's sad and I also have family members who even though they were in the um, upper middle class middle class people they were still unable they were able to afford insulin but they were so bad at taking care of themselves that they've lost legs and those are people that are able to do their insulin every day with for without having to pinch their pennies that's mm -hmm. so that's just coming off of middle america people imagine the detriment that happens to the lower americans who are now like we've said rationing their insulin they're gonna it's gonna come out in the end and it's right. going to be a humanitarian yeah. issue, as you mentioned. Right. It's not and, a and, and, and the big problem, of course, here is the fact that there are no true generic versions yes. of, of insulin available. Um, there's some that come close, but they're, they're not as good as the ones. But a generic is meant to be as good as the, the parent that it's following, basically, put it, put it that way. And you say, why are there no generics? That's wrong. Well, drug pharmaceuticals have found a great workaround. Tweak a molecule here, tweak mm. a molecule there, and let's repatent it. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, with respect to uh, Congressional District 4 for a second, um, and the minority community, the Mexican-American minority community uh, that Isaiah mentioned, and can you imagine uh, living in a trailer park in Greeley and being nine years old and having no health insurance and having your parents have no health insurance and having them work in maybe a meat packing plant, you know, barely making a uh, minimum wage, uh, barely able to afford food, then to be faced with uh, a medical situation like the one that Isaiah has been faced with, yeah. with no insurance. And that's a situation that a lot of people in Congressional District 4 are in right now. And, uh, you know, my opponent, Ken Buck, voted to repeal the ACA and take away health care from 52,000 uh, CD4 residents, um, many of them afflicted with diabetes, for instance, yeah. and um, place them in a situation where they have to ration their insulin. We should talk a little bit about the injectors and the cost of the injectors, uh, because these pharmacy benefit management organizations and um, and these corporations are fixing the prices of not just the drug, but what it takes to deliver the drug. What whatever happened to the good old syringe and a needle? Yeah, I have those. I actually happen to have a bunch of those as backups in case yeah. the medical miracle of that I call my insulin pump decides to fail. Those about a pack of fifty, I think, costs. Ten dollars, which isn't super expensive, but you think how cheap it is to make it. It's a tube of plastic with a needle on it. It's probably four cents, yeah, if anything. It's pocket change, and they're selling it for probably an exponential increase in that type of thing. Right. You mentioned your opponent Ken Buck and the people in this district. About six in ten adults in America have a chronic condition. So this goes outside the scope of Democrat versus Republican. This is a right. humanitarian issue that needs to be addressed by both sides of the aisle. It can't just be Democrats asking for single-payer health care. It needs to be something that both sides are able to come together on, and I think that's something that you can do brilliantly, but also it's very important to all Americans. This isn't just, it's not only Democrats that have diabetes or Republicans that have cancer. It's America's problem, not a party problem. 
it's a human problem, and that's a lot of the problems that we're faced with. Um, and a lot of my policy is based um, uh, soundly, you know, and fundamentally, foundationally, on, on human rights. And really, here in the United States, you know, we were formed on human rights and independence and freedom and liberty. And how uh, can you uh, live a life, um, the cost of what you need to be healthy is so exorbitant and uh, that uh, it uh, actually forces, you know, 60% of the bankruptcies annually in America to occur. Um, we need to uh, talk about how we fix the situation as well as uh, the problems that are in the system. And that's what Isaiah started to talk about for a yeah. second. And that's how we, you know, stand up a public option in our health care system. It's how we bring transparency. It's how we bring federal disclosure standards and transparency standards to the industry. And that's how we start pushing down the costs of uh, prescription medications in health care is with sound federal regulation and oversight. Right. Well, I mean, let, let's re-emphasize here as well that the pharmaceuticals spend three times more on advertising than they do on R&D. We talked about it in the first show. Right. It's worth mentioning again because... <clears throat> guess... You better look straight into the camera. Guess how much it costs the pharmaceuticals to make one vial of insulin. And guess how much they actually charge for it. Isaiah, why didn't you take that one on? Yeah, it, in my research and in my experience, it costs about four dollars to make insulin. A vial of insulin costs about four and that, that dollars. That last four or five days. That per vial, it depends on how much insulin you're using. Oh, that's true. Every insulin dependent Every person is, is different. different. Exactly, but it's four dollars per vial, which for me personally is about nine days worth okay. of, worth of insulin. Right. So you think about that, and then what the drug companies charge over the counter is about $300. I thought this country had laws about profiteering. Because I remember when I first moved over here in the oil embargo, um, gas stations in, in, ba in Baston, where I used to live, <laughs> were actually being uh, sued for profiteering because of the gas shortages. If that cost me four dollars to make i want three hundred dollars for it and if you don't buy it you're going to die these are scumbags i'm not i'm not going to mince my words on this these are absolute scumbags that are doing this and of course it's all being again driven because of profit go on I, as i you jump in here yeah and uh, something that ike actually mentioned last time it's the reason that they're able to do it even though it is frowned upon and illegal and something that should, shouldn't should be happening is because of how much government officials are funded by these special interest groups. You mentioned yeah. that last time. If you want to go back into that, you can. But it's just astounding how much that congressional people are making based on these PACs and super PACs. They're just kind of pushing it under the rug and ignoring it yeah. in a way. Well, they're, 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 they're no better than the drug companies. In fact, they're worse than the drug companies because they're in a position where they right. could actually do something to help the right. people that voted for them. And to me, the interests of the people include access to health care that doesn't bankrupt them, that keeps them alive, and that gives them the freedom to live uh, with liberty and independence. And um, a for-profit driven uh, medical system compromises that. You know, in the richest nation on earth, I think that we can probably figure out a better way of doing it. We just need to look outward and then look back inward and, 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 and identify uh, the problems, which is profiteering in the system. It's these clawbacks. It's processes of um, being able to fix uh, prices um, and only allow access to certain uh, brand name medications, um, we can curtail at the federal level with um, regulation and uh, disclosure mandates. To start pushing the system back towards a patient care centric um, operational. Where it should be. We, we touched on it a little bit about, you know, um, 
the R&D spendings. They're spending most of their money on the delivery mechanism. When these uh, corporations uh, make their insulin available only in these certain delivery systems, and you have research and development dollars being spent with the intent of increasing profits instead of research and development being spent on uh, medications with better efficacy or on research and development um, on pancreatic treatment processes in early stage cases. Um, there's a lot of different ways that we could allocate uh, R&D funding um, and there's billions of dollars in profit every year that should be uh, allocated to research and development of more efficable uh, medications in yes. instead of um, drive up the profits right. of existing systems. If the pharmaceutical companies did what they should do, which is stop spending all this damn money on advertising, <laughs> three times more in marketing. I can remember when mar marketing would be a group of two or three people and development, R&D, would be hundreds of people. I've got a question for Isaiah. Can you only get your insulin via one of these pens, or can you also still buy it as a vial? There's a couple different ways. Uh, vial is how I get my insulin. It's because I have an insulin pump, mm -hmm. which is another price hike in and of itself. But the vials is what I use. There's also, yes, there's insulin pens that come in, they're little, like, they look like little pens that you can do shots with. There's a couple different ways, but they're all controlled, once again, by the same people who are controlling everything. I think that um, we have to talk about uh, the patient because sometimes pumps and things keep a more stable level of insulin in the body. Some of the research and development on things like pumps and pins is good and there, and there should be an equitable amount spent on development of new drugs and therapies um, not just being spent on delivery systems that can you know, force patients into a higher cost avenue of treatment. Right. The best avenue of treatment for each individual patient, that individual patient shouldn't be forced into the highest cost avenue. And right. that's essentially the effect of the um, policy that these pharmacy benefit managers are, are having. Um, sometimes different delivery systems are better. Um, but price gouging those delivery systems is the problem. I think that we need to talk about how we force down the costs of these uh, delivery systems, pumps, pens, etc. Uh, one of the ways of doing that is to have, of course, a public option with mm -hmm. the federal government. And that's what I think we need to work towards accomplishing yeah, and still, in the long term. What I think would be a bigger message, draft legislation that means something, that isn't just funded by these PBM PACs. I really hope that Ike does get elected next time. Really hope that, because... Me too. I'd love, him, <laughs> I'd love him to be in Washington, because <laughs> that means a field trip to interview you. Yeah. Exactly. But it would be Ike versus the rest. And, and, and that, to me, is so disheartening, it's not even funny. I want to thank you so much for, for coming into the CIT network today. It's, it's been absolutely wonderful talking to you. I'm still really upset about all of this research that we did um, because it really shows that there's a gaping hole in, in, in health care in this country. Yeah, I just want to say thanks so much for having me uh, here. Uh, again, uh, on this amazing show, it's been a pleasure to meet you, Isaiah, and uh, thanks for having me uh, again on uh, Rational Politics, Nigel. Isaiah, thank you so much. How, how do you feel after doing your first series of shows? I'm excited to keep doing more. Excellent. That's what I like to hear. Thank you very much for coming in today. Okay, guys, I'm going to talk to you directly. <clears throat> there is something you can do about this, and it's called writing a letter, not an email. Don't do emails. That doesn't work. A real letter. Flood your congressmen. Flood your senators with the fact that they personally are killing you because you're not getting the treatment that you need. Start becoming vocal out there.
Start demanding what this country desperately needs, and that's a real health system, not this total... I'm going to say the word. I'll let Tom beep it out. This total fucking mess that is happening in this country over health care. It has got to get sorted out. People are suffering for no reason, and that is wrong. Thank you very much for watching this Rational uh, Politics. It's good to see you all again, and we will be back in the near future. I'm your host, Nigel Aves, signing off.